Good evening, folks. Good to see everyone back out this evening. Thank the Lord for you. Amen. I thank the Lord. He's been awful good to me. He's a good God. Amen. I get an amen out of that. Amen. amen. Yeah, he, I know he's been, he's been good to all of us, folks. I thank him today. Amen. All the time. I tell you what. I don't know what I'd do without him. Amen. Uh, Brother Dustin May. Would you lead us in prayer, brother? Yes. Yes, brother. Amen. Oh, we got a lot of visitors tonight too, brother Lawson. He'll stand up here and recognize them. I'm sure. We thank the Lord for you. Make yourself at home. If you would stand, get your All American Church hymn. We'll turn to page number one. All hail the power. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you. <clears throat> Page 33, All American. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give. Gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. 
fills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven precious name oh how sweet glad you're here. We've got some folks visiting tonight. I think our brother said some folks from Akron, Ohio. All right, back here in the back. Good to have you. Yes, sir. Have anybody else with us tonight, first time? All right, well, good to have everybody here. We're glad to have people that belong to us. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's good to be here. Think of all the places you could be right now. And you're here. Yes, sir. You could be in Tehran. That's quite a place over there, you know. They just hung two men for blasphemy. Yeah, that's all they did. They blasphemed. Most of the time, it's the prophet, Muhammad. And uh, that's a tough place to live. I wonder if the American elite and liberal crowd has ever thought about that. I don't know that they've really ever thought that through. What awaits if they lower and let that into the country? Well, if you have your Bible, first turn, first, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. We'll title the message tonight, Satan or Christ, who are you listening to? 1 Timothy 3, 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 6. The scripture says, not a novice lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Father, bless this book now. In your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Condemnation of the devil. Now, there's a number of ways of, of looking at this. Uh, one way is that the devil has condemned himself because of his pride. It caused his fall. And, uh, and uh, right now, he, the Lord said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. His fall is gradual and continuous until he winds up in the lake of fire. Or it could also refer to the fact that Satan himself is the accuser of the brethren and that in doing that, he can be very instrumental in condemning an individual. And you need to keep in mind that just because a spirit is talking to you, it doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. You got to be careful with that. You got to try the spirits because the Bible says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Note carefully, it says he is transformed. It doesn't appear he's transformed into an angel of light, an angel bearing light. This is why the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians says, Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than I have preached the gospel of grace, then let him be anathema, let him be cursed, let him be cursed of God. And it's very important for us tonight, the Church of God, to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, folks. That's important. It is. That's very important. And uh, to contend for the faith, of course, the first uh, order of it would be doctrinal. It would be the foundational beliefs of who we are. And the most important foundational belief of who we are is who Christ is. If we don't get that right, the rest of us doesn't matter. So this is why I spend so much time talking like that. 
In the book of John chapter 16, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. And when he has come, he'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll send him. And of course, he comes to do the will of God just like the Son came to do the will of God. You can tell by your fruit as to what spirit you've been listening to. For by their, by, by your fruit you shall, by their fruit you shall know them. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, so forth. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, if your ministry is producing death and division and sorrow and suffering, uh, I, don't care how in, I don't care how dedicated you are to it, you are, you are being energized by the wrong spirit. Amen. You are. And the spirit that, uh, that you're being energized by may give you all the right doctrinal things. You see, folks, the doctrine without the spirit is dead. That's right. The letter, in other words, the letter without the spirit. The letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. What letter is he talking to? Talking about, he's not talking about a lie. He's talking about the letter of the law. But without the ministration of the spirit, it kills. So conviction versus condemnation. Conviction is guilt. The Holy Spirit will bring you into guilt because you believe not on Christ. And once you confess that, then he will bring repentance. It'll be his work. It's not your work. You don't have to produce repentance. That comes from the Holy Spirit. If you receive the right spirit, he will work in your heart to confess and repent of your sin. But condemnation brings guilt, but it goes further than that. Condemnation is passed one step further. It brings punishment. You can never escape. You will always be in bondage to the one who beats you to death, and he'll lay a primrose path before you. He'll give you a life of good deeds. He'll show you how to get over this and over that, do this and do that, but his focus will never be on the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ is the only one that can make you free. Amen. He's the only one, so it'll never work. So the Bible says that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. I want to talk about two things tonight that are very important. One is the blood of Christ, and the other is the soul of Christ. And these are important, very important. They have a, they have a very prominent place in the Bible. As to the blood of Christ, Peter says it this way. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, what? You're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is the redemption payment. The blood of Christ cleanses the sinner's sins. The blood of Christ is doing something you cannot see and maybe not even necessarily feel at the time. But the blood of Christ is absolutely necessary for there's only one that sees it, and that's God the Father. As he saw it in Egypt that night over the doorpost and lentils, he sees the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ opens the gate to heaven. The blood of Christ absolutely is the covenant, the blood covenant that binds the Lord Jesus Christ to us and to God the Father. But then there's also the soul of Christ. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 10, if you'd like to turn there with me tonight, it says this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Let's stop for just a moment now. The second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, is an eternal being, folks. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost make up the fullness of the Godhead. They're eternal. There's no beginning with them. But the God-man that was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea came into being when the second person of the Trinity came down and incarnated himself in human form. Think about that for a moment. And while you're thinking about, think about this. His soul came into being 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. His spirit, the essence of who he is, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. His spirit came down. And when his spirit came down, it impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit, a virgin. 
And that impregnation was the incarnation of God becoming flesh. So therefore, what is offered up, what is offered up for you is the blood and the body and the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that for a moment. Yes, and that all started here. His body did not come down from heaven. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven. The God-man did not come down from heaven. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven. But the God-man, when he was finally perfected, and we'll get to that in Hebrews, ascended by his own power into the very presence of God. That had never happened before. It'll never happen again. So when we read over here in the book of Isaiah 53, he shall see the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So therefore God the Father, and he's the only one that could, look deep into the soul of the God-man, folks, the man, Christ Jesus, the man. The Bible said there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You know, if you get a hold of something like I'm talking about tonight and really really get a hold of it, you'll never be, you'll, no, uh, Jehovah's Witness will never mess you up. No cult will ever mess you up. It'll never happen because there has never been one as highly exalted as the God-man the man, Christ Jesus. It is nothing to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. <laughs> he always has been, always will be, never ceased to be. See what I mean? But when he incarnated himself in flesh, the God man came into being. And by that, the blood came into being. And the scripture says in Acts 20, 28, it's the blood of God. Okay, so therefore, the soul of the God-man could do what only the soul of the God-man could do. The blood of the God-man could do what only the blood of the God-man could do. You follow me here now? This is important. For your salvation is a complete work. It's a complete salvation. There's no failure in it whatsoever. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse 7, it says this, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Can you perfect the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, when I say Lord Jesus Christ, I'm trying to make a difference, you know, in your mind between the person of the second person of the Trinity and the God-man when Christ incarnated himself in human flesh. Can you perfect the second person of the Godhead? No, you can't do that. Can you improve upon God any? It's absolutely, no, it's an impossibility. Who, do, who would do the improving? <laughs> You know, what, what authority, what power is greater than God that, that he might be able to act upon God and do anything to him? That's an utter impossibility. It's ludicrous to even think of, of such a thing. But the writer of Hebrews chapter number five is telling you what went on when the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ was offered up for your salvation. That's what's going on here. Now, here's what I wrote down. This, these this, the, I wrote this a couple hours ago. Listen carefully what I'm, what I'm saying now. The soul of Christ is the giving of his person for you. His complete identity. Everything of who he is. He trusted himself into the hands of the Father. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is when he was made sin for us. Here's the soul of the God-man now has been made the very essence of sin. All I can understand from this is the essence of sin. Remember I told you before, 
the essence of sin is a spiritual thing. Probably when we come into the presence of God, he'll show us things that in this world that we could only vaguely understand. And this is one of them. I told you before, adultery, thieving, murdering, and all of these, these are, these are manifestations. These are, these are the results of the essence of sin. But that's not the essence of sin. That's just an act. It's sin, but it's just an act. You see, sin does not have its origin in adultery. It originated somewhere far above that. How many of you follow me on that? Yes, okay. Now look at this. This is where the terrible suffering and terror of Christ was entered into. Knowing that the terror of the Lord was falling upon him, he cried out from his soul to his father who alone could save him from death. Stop just a moment. Now, folks, there are good people who say that he was crying about not dying on the cross. That right there is as far from the truth as possible. That's not, that's not, the, that's not what's going on here. If you'll read the text carefully and listen, I think you'll begin to see what I'm saying. He cried to the Father who alone could save him from death. Here's the way it says it. With strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. What death? This is a death that words cannot define. This is a death that no human being could possibly understand. This is a death that defines all deaths. The Bible even talks about the second death. This is even greater than the second death because this is the death of the essence of sin. He had become that one on the cross and therefore God was dealing with sin now. The God-man who had become sin is falling into the hands of a holy God. This is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We do not don't understand that. I can't fully take it in. And I know you're just like me. You fear God, I fear God. Do you understand he's almighty? Yes, he's almighty. But I also know at the cross at Calvary, he was dealing with the soul of the God-man. His soul, folks. In plainer words, this is something that is happening to him even after his bleeding had taken place. Something was going on inside, deep, deep down. Note carefully. He cried to the Father who could save him from death. Not physical death on the cross where the blood was shed, but a death that words cannot even begin to describe. Save me from this death, he cried. Taking his place as the condemned, he is filled with fear for the man Christ Jesus is now face to face with the righteousness of Almighty God. We can only conjecture the extent of horror this cast upon the Lamb of God that was taking away the sin of the world. He was heard and that he feared. To minister to fear, he had to fear. In this, he learned obedience. Not that he was disobedient, but the obedient one in the face of terror beyond words experienced the full force of wrath and came forth. Experience is the key to understanding what's going on here. Job said in chapter 23, verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Well, Christ came forth as gold. He passed the test. He passed it in every sense of the word. He had, by his obedience, to be able to come face to face with the horrible wrath of Almighty God. Now, we come before the wrath of God because we are disobedient. And where disobedience was given to us from our father Adam through the male. You remember we've gone through this before, through the seed of the man. Greek word for it, sperma. He gave he, this through the seed. Therefore, according to Romans 5, we inherit that. But on top of that, the mother that brings us into this world does not pass that seed to us. The mother that brings us into the world is not part of the chain. You see what I mean? This is how a mother, a human mother, could bring forth God Almighty in this world into human flesh by the seed of the Father. See, that's how that can happen. But tonight, every one of us are born 
in that. But now here's something for you to do some serious thinking about. What do you believe about original sin? Go look it up now. Read it. Read the definitions of original sin. For there are those out there who believe that an infant, a crying baby, if it dies without being baptized or confirmed or whatever by some church somewhere at some time, it'll go to hell and it'll burn forever. If you believe that, you've got mental problems. You need to go see a shrink. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about the shrink. But you need, you need help from God. You really do. You really do. I mean, how many of you believe Solomon went to heaven? All right. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven abomination to him, hands that do what? Innocent blood. In these things the Lord doth delight. What is it? Righteousness, loving kindness, grace and mercy and long suffering. But in any event, get back off of that and get back to my text here. I'll finish reading it for you. He was the obedient one, descending into the horror of God's wrath and emerging fully qualified to save to the uttermost, to intercede and come before God as their representative. Bearing them on his shoulder and in his heart, he is the perfect Savior. This is where he was made perfect. In plain words, the perfection was brought from the God-man who originated on this earth. He originated right here. The God-man did. Not the second person of the Trinity. Have to make that clear. But where he started, look the path he took what he had to go through until he was a finally brought to the right hand of the Father. How many follow in that town? Think about that. Think about it. The cross is one thing. That's a horror beyond imagination. The suffering that goes on in the tree. But I dare say to you that what he went through in his soul was greater than the tree. And that's not in any way to diminish the tree. But my dear friend, that soul went down down. It says this in the book of Acts chapter number 2, quoting the Old Testament. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The Greek word translated hell is Hades or Hades. You hear it mostly translated. And that is the counterpart in the New Testament of the Old Testament, Sheol. Basic meaning, the unseen state of the dead. The Bible definition, you have a you have a part that is called Abraham's bosom, and then you have a part over there where the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, and there's a great gulf between the two. That's, what it, that's the Bible definition of Hades. Now, the Greeks have their definition of Hades. I mean, you can go back into Greek culture and see what they talk about, the river Styx and all of that stuff. You can go back and read all if you want to. But the Bible does not borrow from Greek culture and Greek tradition, even though it uses Greek words because it's written in Greek. Don't let Greek culture, okay, don't let Greek culture define Greek words that are used in the Bible. Let the Bible define the words that it uses in the Bible. See? Okay. And that's where we are with this. Therefore, he is the perfect Savior. Because he's the perfect Savior, he becomes the author of eternal salvation. Now, listen to what Peter said about this. This is real good. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 10. I love the way Peter says things, and this, this is quite a thing. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 10. Simon Peter. Now look at this thing. 1 Peter 1.10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Did they know it was the Spirit of Christ? They may not have, but they knew the Spirit was in them. The Spirit of Christ simply means it gives it an identity. Christ himself looking forward into the future to the salvation that he is about to create. Now look at this. Look at it carefully. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand 
the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There are the two comings, the coming of the Messiah to suffer, Mashiach ben Joseph, and then the, some, the glory that should follow, Mashiach ben David. In other words, Mashiach is the Messiah, the son of Joseph, or the Messiah, the son of David. That's the only way they can make sense of it. They have to have two messiahs because obviously one suffers, one reigns. But the Christian only needs one messiah and two comings. That's the way it works. He comes the first time to suffer. He comes the second time to reign. But now look what Peter said here. Now look at this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel to you of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. I suppose they are frustrated <laughs> because he used the angels as the mediators when he gave the first testament for the law. But when it comes to this one, no angel, no part of it, none whatsoever. Now look at this, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Now think about it for a moment. How many of you ever heard somebody say, well, there's no difference in Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation? How many of you ever heard somebody say that? Heard preachers preach it. What are they talking about here? They're talking about a salvation here that the Old Testament saints knew nothing about. That's what they're saying. They knew nothing about it. It doesn't mean what they had was bad. Not at all. Good night, no. But what it means is there's a progressive revelation and then there's a progressive covenant there's a new covenant, and it's a blood covenant. And this is what's going to happen. Now he even tells you in Jeremiah 33, and he tells you in Hebrews chapter number 8, there's even coming something again, uh, new in the future. And what is that? The, what's coming in the future will be when no man shall teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days according to Hebrews chapter number 8. But the writer of Hebrews makes it very clear, folks, and these are the kind of things that just lay out before you. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear in Hebrews 8 that there is a coming, there's coming a covenant for the Jewish people that is not what's happening right now. But it still comes under the one blood covenant for all, for there's only one sacrifice for sins forever. Amen. There's only one. One blood sacrifice, one blood covenant, but they will have an appearance with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for the one they crucified and he will make a relative covenant with them and that will go into the millennium. So the apostle Peter said this, they searched for this salvation. Now that can be said two ways. Now think about this. Uh, when you were saved by the grace of God, uh, you were saved because God honors his word. He always honors his word, by the way. He can do nothing else but honor it. And he honored his word, you believed, and you were born of the spirit of God. Therefore, you received the promise of God, the salvation of the Lord, and you were saved. But it can also be said this way too, that you received a person when you received that salvation because the Lord Jesus Christ is the salvation of God, a person. And so if you say it that way, look at the text of which person <laughs> the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They were looking for the coming of Christ in the Old Testament, but not in the way most people think. They knew they needed something. They were preaching 2,000 years ago, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. They knew that. They knew that. And so therefore, when, when the apostle Paul was called and God revealed to him at the top of Sinai, probably where he went, he began to understand this covenant, this blood covenant. He began to understand it. And, and when he did, uh, I'm sure he did some rejoicing in it. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the author. He wrote the constitution of eternal salvation. Now, do you believe tonight once saved, always saved? I do. I believe if it's left up to me, I'd be in bad shape. I really would. I know me. <laughs> no, I don't believe that I'm able to keep that which God has given me. I believe he's able to keep that. 
Eternal salvation, therefore, now note carefully, is in the context of the God-man descending into the horror and judgment of Almighty God. It is through that that he becomes the author of eternal salvation. Once through it, once from it, then he writes the Constitution. That's the law of it. He writes it down. What constitutes it? That's what it means. What gives it substance? That's what the word means. He writes the Constitution of eternal salvation. That ought to make anybody shout. Why? Because he felt everything you feel. He went through everything you could possibly go through a hundredfold. He endured everything that any human could possibly or ever has had to endure. God turned his back on him and abandoned him and left him on the cross. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when he died upon that cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I know heaven is black, and I know you're not listening, but into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. And I'll tell you right now, the Father received the spirit, and he descended as Jonas into the lower parts of the earth. All of these things so he could be the author of eternal salvation. Amen. I'm glad my name's written down there. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I am. Because in this age, this age when you can get dementia or you can get Alzheimer's or, you know, I'm, a lot of you may have had personal experience with it and, uh, and you can understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes begin to lose your mind, your mind, and you're not what you used to be. Well, if you do that, are you going to lose your salvation? No, no, sir. This is why Sunday morning when I preached, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Romans talks about waiting for the, of the, the, the purchased possession, that he's coming to get that purchased possession. That's, that, that's good stuff. Amen. Amen. So the blood of Christ cleanses your sins, and the soul of Christ literally saves you from the inside out and everything there can be possibly saved and it doesn't stop with the salvation at your altar. He continues now after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5, notice carefully, Melchizedek is included in this. After the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek is his name, Abraham paid tithe to him. And the Bible says, truly the less is blessed of the greater who blessed who when Abraham came before Melchizedek? I may remember. Who did? Who blessed who? That's right. Melchizedek did the blessing. You mean he blessed the father of the faith? Yes, he did. Why? Because he's greater. Who is he? I don't have a clue. <laughs> Maybe I know a lot of guys think they got it figured. Some say it's Shem. Some say it's a physical manifestation of Christ. You can't prove any of it. Maybe. Who knows? <clears throat> but the bottom line is this. Melchizedek predated the Aaronic priesthood. Melchizedek was at Moriah. He was there in Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He was there before David ever took it. He was there 900 years before David and Israel ever took Moriah and they took Jerusalem. Melchizedek was there. Melchizedek is a, he's a contemporary of Jethro. Who's Jethro? Well, no, he's not. No, he's not. I'll take that back. No, he's not. Jethro is Moses, 1400 B.C. Melchizedek is 500 years before that. That's right. Melchizedek is 500. He's 1900 B.C. Jethro, who was Jethro anyway, by the way? Anybody have any idea who Jethro was? Moses' father-in-law. Exactly. He was called the priest of Midian. So what you have here is Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, ministering to all of mankind, not just the house of Israel, not the Aaronic priesthood. He ministers to all mankind. And so therefore, the writer of Hebrews, chapter number five, is saying to the Jews, the Hebrews that read this scripture, listen, we know you believe in God. No doubt in our mind. We know you know the true God. You know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. We know that. No question about that. But this man, Hebrews chapter number five, he says to them, is God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews chapter number two. It's Hebrews chapter number one. Look how he starts it off. Turn to Hebrews with me. 
I don't have it marked, so it'll take me just a moment to get over here to it. The first chapter of Hebrews, I've covered this with you before, but it's important to understand it in the context of what we're talking about tonight. Verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past, time past the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Okay? Who being the brightness, now watch this verse 3, this is important. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his now, that's an English word right there, that word person, okay? That's a simple English word. But if you opened up the Greek text and saw what word that was translated from, it'd make your head spin. Hypostasis, hypostasis. What does that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of the essence of Almighty God. That's what that means. The writer of Hebrews doesn't pull any punches. When you begin to read the book of Hebrews, you come away with, with the distinct knowledge that the God-man manifest 2,000 years ago on this earth is God of very God. The blood that flowed through his veins was the blood of God. And the God-man descended down into the pit of the wrath and judgment of God. And by doing that, he fought it. He dealt with it. He came face to face with it. And when he came out of it, he came out of it perfected to be the author of eternal salvation to everyone that believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And because he made his soul an offering for sin, it is the soul of the God-man sitting next to the God the Father in heaven that is the intercessor for us. Hebrew, or Romans chapter number 8. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. How does he do that? What qualifies him to do that? What we just said. He went down, Hebrews chapter number 5, gave himself at the cross, and then he gave, he gave his body and his blood at the cross, and he gave his soul when he descended down and became victor and rose from the dead. That's salvation, folks. That's salvation ever since of the word. Well, then what's my part? You don't have a part. Amen. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? You can't do anything. What, what do you mean? You accept what's been done. That's the key. Please, that's the key. So what do you mean? You come to him, you fall before him, you cry out to him, and you say, Lord Jesus, I can't do anything to change myself. I can't save myself. I can't, I can't cleanse my sins. All of that is just a waste of my time but you've done every bit of it for me. Amen. And I receive you. You're the Savior. You're my Savior. And I receive you by faith into my soul. And brother, and you talk like that, you believe that, you're going to get your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And when he saved me, he begun a good work in me. And what does it say with that? He that hath begun a good work in you will do what? That's right. He'll perform it. He'll do it. He'll get it done. He started it. He'll finish it. By the way, he never starts anything he doesn't finish. Now, I've started a few jobs and found out I was in over my head. <laughs> I had to call in a profile. How many of you had to start something and had to call in somebody who knew what they were doing? All right. I'm not the only one. <laughs> but not him. When he starts it, he finishes it. Father, thank you, Lord. We cannot exalt the blessed Son of God high enough. These words can't do it, but my soul does, Lord. I love him. I bless him and I praise him. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my God. I give my life to you again tonight, Lord Jesus. Take my life. It's in your hands. I don't know what to do with it. All I, could do with it, do, all I could ever do with my life, Lord, is what I did with it for 27 years before I met you. Waste it, throw it away. But I pray tonight, I put it in your hands. I pray you'd make something good of it. I pray you'd use me for the glory of God. I pray for the folks in this house and those that are watching, those that will watch it later. I pray you'd bless them, minister to them. May this word ring clear in their soul. In Jesus' name. And I want you to keep your heads bowed tonight. Anybody say, Preacher Lawson, I... 
I think God's spoken to me through that, and I just want him to continue to move with me in my heart and, and lead me and guide me and show me more and teach me. I'm, I'm, I'm teachable. Are you teachable tonight? Are you willing to learn? I am. I ask God to teach me, boy, do I ever. Well, God bless you. God bless your soul. God bless every one of you. Amen. I think as long as you're teachable, you can learn. And I sure don't know everything there is to know. About a few things, only about a few things I know about enough to get to get in trouble. But some things I've got nailed down in my soul. And this is one of them right here. I know whom I have believed. It's not left up to me to try to figure out what's going on inside my heart. It's not left up to me to try to define all the essences and the nuances and, and degrees of sin. That's not my job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll let him do his work. And I'll, do, I'll let him do it in my heart. And how do you do that then, preacher? You walk in fellowship and you walk in the light. You remember that one? If you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses a constant cleansing a present tense cleansing cleanses from all sin. Amen. Isn't that good? Bless them, Lord. Bless their hands. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you for listening to me. I had to get that off my soul. Every once in a while, I get into something in my office, and Linda will say, what's going on up there? <laughs> She'll hear a racket. No. <laughs> How many ever had that happen to you? You just got flat carried away. Yes, sir, I'm telling you. <laughs> Brother gave me this tonight, Brother uh, Fitzpatrick. Uh, this, how many of you know Brother Bingham, Boyd Bingham, up in Kentucky? This is a good man, folks. Brother Bingham's a good man. That's a good church. Well, his wife has been sick with cancer, Joan. And uh, he gave me this update and it says, we had a follow-up PET scan done, and the cancer is drastically reduced, it says. A few small places remain as we move on to the second phase of the treatment. We continue to thank God for answered prayers. He's been nothing but faithful. Our next treatments will be in Nashville, Tennessee, so we ask that you continue to pray. We would never thank each of you enough as your prayers have made a difference. And I th every time I see him now, I think about his wife. If you'll notice, they've kind of changed the format of their ministry up there. He's on one side and his son's on the other. And, and they're, you know, I think they do a lot with prophecy. And uh, his son's a minister now. He's ordained minister. His son overcame cancer too. I think he had a bout with cancer. Uh, I can't think of his son's name. Boyd, was his son Boyd? Boyd, yeah. And so please pray for Joan, his wife. Please pray for her and uh, lift her up. I've got a letter from uh, Brother Randy Pike's widow, and I didn't bring it tonight, but I'll have it Sunday morning, and I'll read it to you. She sent a good letter, and Brother Pike, of course, you know, went on to be with the Lord not long ago. Brother, and, and the people that I've known since I've been in the ministry, folks, in the top ten, he's right up there in the top ten. He's one of the best men I've ever, ever known, and he's smart. Randy Pike's smart, uh, and God used him greatly. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll read that letter for you Sunday. Does anybody else have a request tonight? Yes, ma'am. times they get into hard time and that's where they find the Lord again. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody else? Yes, ma'am.
Amen. Now, y'all went to Houston, I understand. Is that where your dad lives? I figured that, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. They've been having a real heat wave out west right now. That one. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. We love you too, Tammy. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, Satan can beat you to death with fear. Yes, he can. Yeah, the Bible said fear hath torment. I mean, it can wear you out. Yes, ma'am. I saw that email today. Yeah. They had that on the news. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir.
agree. We don't have any idea of the freedoms that have been lost right now. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Children come first in my book. Amen. Of course, outside the Lord, you understand that. But children, anybody messing with children, I want to have a use for them. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. change. You let him come into the hands of Almighty God and a whole lot of things can change fast. All right. Yes, ma'am. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, congratulations. God bless you. Amen. 54 years. That's good. Amen. <laughs> this generation today doesn't think anything like that's possible. That's good. 54 years. God bless you. Amen. 54 years. <laughs> this lady sends me uh, some emails here and there. She's got a green thumb. Big time. If you want to get somebody to grow some flowers for you, right there's the lady. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Where's this just now? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that'd be a shame to lose our crops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's her sister. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Folks, I believe in prayer. God answers prayer. James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Pray one for, the, one for another that you may be healed. Amen. All right. Anybody else before we pray tonight? Unspoken request. Please remember my family. Please, 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 please. Pray for my family. Brother Caleb Wilson, lead us in prayer. Thank you, brother. Uh, let's see. This day, uh, what is this? This is seven. This is July. Well, this is still, we're still in June. I've got the Keith to Cal. Okay, I don't have a calendar with his. Uh, that's not going to stop you from singing, brother. Amen. Go, come on up here. <laughs> He said you were sick Sunday. I was, but I'm feeling much better. Thank you good. for praying. Thank you so much. We're good. Power of prayer. That's right. That's what I'm saying. You know, the Lord Jesus loves us so much. <coughs> Heard a great teaching message tonight. No matter where you are, what predicament you may be going through, you find yourself in. We need to remember that God is always waiting and wanting us to come to him in prayer, to talk with him. So many times we don't do that. I don't like I should. But he's faithful to hear us and answer our prayers because his love never ceases and his mercy, his mercies are new every morning. The Bible says the righteous cry and the Lord heareth. <clears throat> and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> sins 
and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to Forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. The steadfast. Stand up, have a word of prayer. We'll let you go tonight, folks. See you on Sunday, this coming Sunday, which is July the 2nd, I think. Fourth is this uh, is a Tuesday, next Tuesday. Um, so let's pray, and God be with you, and God bless you, and take care of you. Brother O'Melanick, will you dismiss us tonight?